Starting off this countdown, we have the residents. Believe it or not, but there are people that still live in Chernobyl, even though it's highly dangerous to do so. It's estimated that there are around 130 to 150 people currently living there. Many of them are older women. In fact, they have been given the name Chernobyl's Babushkas. Now, you may be wondering, how do they live there when there's no operating grocery store and stuff like that? Well, they live off of the land. They are still farming their family's land. But the thing is, the water and soil there is still highly contaminated. So why would they take this risk? Well, one of the elderly ladies featured in a documentary about Chernobyl's Babushkas said, and I quote, radiation doesn't scare me, starvation does. After the nuclear disaster, these ladies fled their home, but over the years they have all come back. Despite there being no hospitals or grocery stores, they don't care. They just want to be on their homeland. And turns out their bodies have somewhat adjusted to the high levels of radiation there. We're going to kick things off with a ghost story told by a nuclear physicist named Andriy Kruskov after he visited Pripyat in 1997. He toured the number four reactor sarcophagus where the explosion had taken place. He was taking readings for radiation when he heard what sounded like screams coming from the inside, which was completely off limits due to the radiation. He described the experience saying, quote, I ran upstairs to tell someone, but they said that when I entered the reactor control room, I was the first person to open that door in three years. And the only way to get inside the old reactor is through the doors I came in through. If someone had gone inside the reactor when I wasn't looking, they would have tripped an alarm that goes off when the reactor door is opened mechanically. The reactor door requires a password and handprint, yet someone or something was inside. Later that evening, as we were eating dinner outside the building by the river next to the plant, a floodlight turned on in the room of the installation. There was no way anyone could be inside. As we ate, we figured there was a power surge or something. Then, just as my colleague said that, the light turned off. Number nine, the CIA did it. After the release of the critically acclaimed HBO series Chernobyl, I really can't stress enough how much you guys need to watch the show. It's so good. It's literally the highest rated show of all time. What more do you want? Anyways, after the TV series came out, the Russian government released a statement that the TV show was anti-Soviet Union propaganda and that they were going to make their own TV series telling the real story about how the reactor melted down because the CIA sabotaged it and it was all America's fault. This is some major tea on both sides. They're spilling tea about each other. Will Russia and the USA ever learn to get along? Are we going to have to listen to the two of them complain about each other until the end of time? We should just get these two countries to kiss and get it over with. There has been unbroken sexual tension between these two since Rocky IV. Just start playing nice already. Please. In our number 8 spot today we have boars. Boars are often seen wandering around the exclusion zone, but they also make their way into the surrounding towns as well, which is creating quite a problem. Boars are a fairly common food source and it's not unusual to come across one, but here's the problem if you live in the area, how are you supposed to tell which boars are radioactive and which aren't? Basically, you can't until it's too late. The boars who aren't radioactive might come across and intermingle with one who is, but they also like to eat mushrooms. and if they're searching for their food within the exclusion zone, it's a highly likely possibility that they'll find themselves eating a radioactive mushroom. This is posing quite a problem. In 2017, there was a study that found that approximately one out of every three boars that were killed in the nearby areas of Germany, which for the record isn't even that close to Chernobyl, have been found to be radioactive and super unsafe for human consumption. You'd think that being that far away would make you safe, but as we clearly now know, the effects of the disaster stress far and wide. At number six, we have silhouettes. You may remember this one from one of my other Chernobyl videos too. The mystery here is we have no idea if these silhouettes are actually based on real people or if it's just a morbid art piece done by another Chernobyl creepy artist. New silhouettes show up all of the time, all over the town of Pripyat, and the only other mystery here is who is behind it? Is it one talented artist or is it a group that has decided to take turns so no one ever gets the true answer? No matter what, these things sure do add to the creep factor of this ghost town, and I'm sure it's also a terrifying sight to see at night. Moving on at number six, we have the abandoned cooling tower. A partially constructed cooling tower can be found at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. They were built to evaporate the cooling water from the two new reactors. Sadly, they were never completed. 
Now, these things are massive. The diameter was over 120 meters and it stands at 150 meters tall. Obviously, after the accident, there was no need to continue on with the construction of this, so the government just left the towers there along with everything else. Eventually, over time, nature will have its way with it and it will start to erode and crumble. It's just crazy seeing all these abandoned infrastructures. Imagine how life would have been if that explosion never happened. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the Toxic River. There's a river that's just filled with radioactive water right near the reactor. The scariest part is despite how toxic the water is, a bunch of aquatic life live there. In particular, giant catfish. Yes, giant catfish. A video from 2016 shows a massive catfish swimming in the water. People originally were like, oh my god, what the heck is that? It must be some sort of mutated animal. Later, it was just found out to be a giant catfish. But still, what the heck? And it's the fact that they have adapted to be able to survive in that highly toxic water. Like, that just baffles me. Not only that, but but they can thrive there because the water has no higher predators. Obviously though, you're not allowed to go fishing there. Okay, I feel like that's a given, but I also feel like people would still try it, so I'm just gonna say it. Don't go fishing there. In our fourth spot, we have the jarfish. Speaking of fish, we're gonna go with this. So back in 2016, photographer and journalist Miriam Wazer took a trip to explore the ruins of Chernobyl. While inside an abandoned building, she came across something very creepy and odd. She found a bunch of fish and other specimen in jars. Why someone was collecting fish, it just baffles many. And they weren't even like proper beakers or science mason jars. No, no, it looked like someone emptied out their jar of pickles and then used it to store the specimen. I think it's best if those remain untouched. Like, can you imagine how stinky they would be if they were open nowadays? They would reek. Old stinky fish is not something I would ever want to handle. Now the other specimen beside the fish are unknown. No one knows what the heck they are. But if you know, let me know in the comments below. In our number seven spot today, we have Shavalsky's horse. These horses first originated in Mongolia and were wild horses that became endangered. They first became endangered due to hunters who would often kill the stallion, which of course would provide many difficulties in terms of reproduction. These horses weren't doing well in captivity, which made things even more difficult. This combined with the harsh winters, which would often claim their lives, left things looking quite grim for the species. In the late 1990s, however, in an effort to help repopulate these animals, 30 of them were released into the Ukrainian side of the exclusion zone, and it is believed that some of these original horses are actually still alive today, which is amazing, but camera trap images have also shown young horses, which means that they are repopulating, which is a huge win. Their expanding population in such a harsh environment could mean that they might potentially be able to return from the brink and go on to continue as a species, which is something we always want to see. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the disaster. We talk a lot about Chernobyl, but how often do we really discuss how this disaster actually happened in the first place? What actually went on that caused it? The Chernobyl nuclear disaster occurred on April 26th, 1986 in Ukraine, which at the time was a part of the Soviet Union. During a routine safety test, a series of errors and design flaws led to an explosion in reactor four of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The explosion caused a massive fire that released radiation radioactive material into the atmosphere, which was carried by wind across Ukraine, Belarus, and other parts of Europe. The disaster was caused by a combination of factors, including a flawed reactor design, a lack of safety, and human error. During the safety test, the reactor's power output dropped to dangerously low levels, leading to an attempt to restore power that resulted in a sudden surge. This caused the reactor to overheat, leading to a steam explosion that destroyed the reactor's upper structure. The accident caused immediate deaths due to the explosion as well as long-term health effects from exposure to radiation. The Chernobyl disaster remains the worst nuclear accident in history in terms of the number of deaths and the environment.
environmental impact. It led to significant changes in nuclear safety regulations and increased awareness of the potential risks of nuclear power. In our number 9 spot today we have The Operator. This story is one that comes directly from Alexei Brius, who is a control room operator at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, and this is his story of the day of the disaster which starts as he was traveling on a bus to work on April 26th, 1986, knowing nothing of the historic disaster that occurred just hours before. As he arrived, he thought, quote, it looked like it would be a mass grave. I was sure that the whole night shift had died there. He continued on to say, quote, at the moment of the explosion, I was in Pripyat in my flat. I was sleeping tightly. I didn't hear. I didn't see anything. In the morning, I was to go to work, and so I did. I knew nothing about the disaster. I just got on a bus and went to work. As I was coming close to the station, I saw from the bus that the block was destroyed. I always say that my hair stood on its end when I saw that. I didn't understand why me and other workers were brought there, but it turned out that there was still much work to be done. Me and my co-workers got off the bus and tried to enter the territory of the fourth block as we were supposed to. There was a guard wearing a rubber-coated army suit who had orders not to let anyone in. Finally, they agreed. The guarding sergeant gave us each a pill of potassium iodide. I took it immediately. It was a special medicine made to protect the thyroid gland from radiation. All my life, I remember him with gratitude. The upper part of the reactor and the separator barrel were open. The main circulating pump was seen from the outside. Down the reactor, I saw the reactor's emergency cooling system all ruined. Its pieces were mixed with slabs of concrete. I was stepping over lumps of black graphite. I didn't want to admit what I saw, just like many other people, that it was black graphite. Alexei goes on to explain that he and the other operators had to, quote, save those injured by fire, debris, hot water, and steam and radiation. We were to find them, carry them out, and deliver them to the medical personnel and go look for others. We saved and brought everybody out, except for one person. He is still somewhere there, inside the reactor. In our number 9 spot today, we have barn swallows. Any animal who lives in the exclusion zone have been affected by the disaster, and that includes those who spend most of their time in the sky. I'm obviously talking about birds. The barn swallows in Chernobyl are one animal who have seen a change in their physical appearance that has lasted all of the years since the nuclear meltdown. It is unclear why these birds have been affected greater than their land animal counterparts, or if these changes will ever reverse to their previous state, but here's what they are currently dealing with. The swallows appear to have severely deformed beaks, disproportionate feathers, some had partial albinism, and they were seen to have much smaller brains. Of course, some of these issues are much worse than others, and I'm sure these changes have significantly affected their ways of life, but of course they continue to adapt as time goes on. It is sad that this human-made disaster has affected them in such a negative way, but the fact that they are still around really shows their adaptability and resilience. Starting us off at number 10 are Dewey's old favorite, dolls. Remember this one? Yeah, so in case you missed a few of our other Chernobyl videos, there are large piles of creepy, most likely possessed, burned up, radioactive dolls everywhere. Where are they coming from? Well, odds are most of these are actually coming from tourists and people looking to grab that one spooky and scary pick for the gram, but no one knows how this all came to be. It's hard to know if this started from actual dolls that witnessed the explosion or if someone just had the bright idea one day to start adding messed up dolls all over the exclusion zone. In the end, we will never know because unless you are a regular there at the exclusion zone, it's hard to distinguish which dolls have been there since day one and which ones are new additions. Either way, I hate all of it. In our number six spot today, we have cats. In the rush of the evacuation, many pets were left behind in Chernobyl, and that of course includes cats. With little to do, and of course more kittens being born, this paved the way for a group of feral cats to take over the exclusion zone. These cats wander in and out of the zone and find all of their favorite snacks, such as radioactive rodents or the less common radioactive insects. These cats certainly have had quite a difficult time surviving, as they are a perfect tasty snack for much larger predators and are certainly not equipped to deal with the harsh winters, but even still, there is said to be at least a hundred stray cats living in the exclusion zone. There are efforts underway to have the uncontaminated ones put up for adoption, but the difficulty is in testing them and also re-domesticating these animals who have had to fend for themselves for so long. In our number five spot today, we have dogs. Since we just talked about the cats who were sadly left behind, it's only fair we talk about the dogs too. It's strange that these two domesticated animals would have such different experiences after the disaster, but they absolutely 
absolutely have. There are far more dogs who have managed to survive throughout the years than cats, but that is most likely due to the fact that they aren't as easy to catch and eat as prey as cats are. But dogs have a whole other challenge, and that is they have a hard time hunting and feeding themselves. There are workers who continue to work the dangerous job at the plant, and they continually feed the dogs living in the zone, which is something that truthfully is so nice to hear. It is also said that there are dogs living in this area that have begun mating with wolves, which is only going to breed dogs that will be more likely to be able to survive on their own, which I suppose is a good thing. Similar to the cats, many of the stray dogs are being studied to see if they can be adopted into homes outside of the zone so that they don't have to continue living in these harsh environments that they really were not bred for. Coming in at number 9, we have the gas masks. And if you guys are liking this video or want to see part 3, then smash that like button. Chernobyl already looks like the place where an apocalypse occurred. Buildings are completely abandoned, run down, and overgrown with nature. What doesn't help is the piles upon piles of gas masks scattered all throughout Chernobyl. This really adds to the eeriness of this place. And again, makes it look like a place where a zombie or alien takeover occurred. In fact, there is one room inside a school which is just completely filled with child size gas masks. It's very creepy but also sad. Like imagine how frightened the young children were when this happened. The gas masks found there are just a sad reminder of the horrors that took place there when the reactor exploded. In our number 4 spot today we have European Grey Wolves. One of the species of animals that has been thriving ever since the disastrous nuclear meltdown has been the European Grey Wolf. Due to the lack of humans in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, they have been able to thrive and it has been said that the wolves in this area actually have a population that is 7 times higher than that of comparable sites. Researchers are still trying to figure out exactly why this is happening, but it has obviously shown them that despite the effects of radiation in humans, the radiation clearly isn't affecting the wildlife's ability to reproduce. So this seems like just a regular grey wolf, but here's where things get a little different. Just because the wolves seem to be doing fine doesn't mean they aren't radioactive. These wolves, since they're such a high population, are beginning to travel farther and spread out more, which creates quite a problem. Not that we're just going up and petting wolves, but if you did come in contact with one of these wolves, you'd be getting a high dose of radiation just by touching them. Touching a carcass of these wolves with bare hands is absolutely not recommended. So while it is absolutely incredible to see the wildlife doing so well in this zone, we are now faced with an entirely different issue that we haven't really ever had before. In our number 3 spot today we have the Eurasian Lynx. This one is on this list for a different reason than most. It isn't because of anything this animal is or isn't doing, but instead is due to the fact that this animal was once believed to have entirely disappeared from Europe. It was fairly recently in 2014 that researchers realized they had made a comeback in a big way. Similar to most of the animals we've talked about today, the Eurasian lynx has been able to thrive due to the lack of human population and interference. Their downfall was attributed to urbanization as well as hunters, and they were mostly wiped out in the early 20th century, although they remained in certain parts of Siberia. There is still a lot more research that needs to be done about these creatures to determine exactly how radioactive they are, and this will take time due to the dangers of the zone they reside in, as well as the nature of these creatures in general. But just being able to see that an animal that was struggling has been able to make such a comeback is probably one of the best things to come out of such a horrible disaster. In our number 2 spot today we have bison. Bison are right up there with wolves for most dangerous radioactive animal, and that is due to their size, as well as the fact that they are a source of food for some. These huge animals can weigh up to 2,200 pounds and are certainly not an animal that is easily messed with. Many bison weren't affected by the radiation immediately and instead it became much more of an issue once they started eating food that had been contaminated. They like to feed on grass and a lot of it and the radiation didn't only affect animal life but plant life as well making their food source a literal feeding ground for radioactive material. Similar to the wolves we talked about before, running into these guys isn't only a threat now because of their size but now because if you get too close, you could be facing some unsafe levels of radiation. In our number one spot today, we have spiders. I've talked about my hatred for spiders a lot on this channel, but to be honest, they keep doing cool things, so I have to keep talking about them. Okay, well, maybe this one is less cool and more scary, but still, they deserve a spot. Spiders that are residing within the exclusion zone are, of course, radioactive, but it's not only the spiders that are now dangerous to touch, but it is also their webs. Spiders in Chernobyl are literally making 
making radioactive webs, which is the stuff straight out of a comic book. These radioactive webs are also being woven in much different ways than they were before, which would suggest some sort of genetic mutation at play. Spiders were already a creature I'd like to stay far, far away from, but radioactive spiders really adds a whole other level. Not only are the spiders now dangerous for non radioactive animals to touch, but walking through their web is equally as dangerous to those who aren't thriving in the radiation. So not only do you have to watch out for the regular old radioactive material, but now also the never ending construction of radioactive webs. Great. At number nine, we have missing silver filters. Remember those pile of creepy dolls? Yeah, of course you do. It literally just freaking happened. Well, in addition to the piles of dead dolls, there are also piles of old gas masks everywhere, especially in one old school classroom. Some cheeky and hilarious, sick, person even put some of these masks on dolls. Isn't that great? Anyway, what is mysterious about these gas masks is that these filters inside of all of them have been removed. And these filters contain just a small amount of silver in them. And what is most likely what happened is that looters came and took all of them. But what was done with the silver? No one really knows. If looters did indeed steal them, then I'm guessing that somewhere out there, some people have radioactive jewelry or even silverware because they most likely sold it. It's hard to say, but if any of you watching have your own Geiger meters at home right now, I would check it out on anything silver in your home because you might just have a Chernobyl souvenir without even knowing it. At number eight, we have Survivor Immortality. While this one doesn't take place in Chernobyl exactly, it stems from Chernobyl. One Russian scientist who survived the explosion back in 1986 and six other Russian scientists have recently relocated to the small Greek island of Gavdos. There is some conspiracy though because some believe that these scientists actually relocated to the island to become immortal. Gavdos has 50 residents in total on the island and it is believed to have mythical healing powers that make its residents immortal. Reporters from Vice interviewed a filmmaker who was making a documentary on the island and found out that the scientists work on various inventions from inside the local compound. They also have seven acres of land that was given to them by a priest. Some think these Russian scientists are spies, while others believe they moved out there to not only become immortal themselves, but also clear them of all the radiation using the mystical powers of the island. They are apparently also building a temple named the Temple of Apollo. I think these guys were a little too close to the blast, if you know what I mean. At number seven, we have the random examination chair. Out in the middle of a wooded area in the exclusion zone is a random gynecologist chair. How the hell did it get there? <laughs> no one freaking knows. It can only be assumed that this chair was picked up by some local pranksters who went through the trouble of picking up this radioactive artifact and brought it to a random spot in the woods. But that is so much freaking work. I mean, guys, why? Aside from that, every other possibility is straight up terrifying. Maybe the blast blasted the chair out in the forest, but if it did, then why was there one of these chairs so close to a freaking radioactive reactor? See, it, it, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So it's just another unproven, less than appealing site that can be found in the exclusion zone. Starting us off in our top three, at number three, we have alien saviors. In this case, they quite literally came in peace. An eyewitness by the name of Mikhail Varitsky claimed to have seen a large fireball of light hovering above the reactor on the night of the explosion. Later on September 16th in 1989, apparently there was another huge radiation leak, and it is reported that this same ball of light was seen in the exact same spot once again. Many believe it to be aliens that were actually protecting us from the radioactive blast. Some claim that the blast was nowhere near as big as what it could have been and that these aliens actually helped absorb and clean up whatever extra radiation that they could to save us. You know me, I'm all about the alien theories, but I'm not sure about this one. I will say, many say similar events happened during the Fukushima accident as well. Oh well, aliens, if you are listening to me right now and you did help us, thank you. Now, show yourself. At number two, we had the Blackbird of Chernobyl. In April of 1986, right before the explosion in July, many reported seeing a large creature that looked like a blackbird flying around Chernobyl. This creature was large with red glowing eyes and was compared to America's legend, the Mothman. Why? What's so similar between a large Mothman and a large blackbird? Well, both of these creatures had large glowing red eyes as well as both showed up right before major events. The Mothman appeared and was spotted right before the Silver Bridge collapse in Point Pleasant, West Virginia 
Virginia in 1967, which reportedly killed 46 people. Some survivors of the Chernobyl blast reported seeing this giant scary creature fly away from the reactor after the blast. Many believe that this bird was a paranormal entity that was a harbinger of terrible things to come. Others believe it was just a large stork. I don't know what to believe here, but the idea of a giant paranormal creature that is similar to the one that was seen in the US 20 years before gives me goosebumps in the best way possible. I love monster and ghost lore, which is what brings us to our number one spot. And finally, coming in at number one, we have my favorite, ghosts. That's right, not just named a ghost town because it's abandoned, but also because there are many different spirits that are said to be found here. Andre Karsukov, a nuclear physicist from New York, told one story after his visit to the area back in 1997. Karsukov reports that he went to the power station one day at 7.30 a.m. and visited the number four reactor in the sarcophagus. You know, the big containment unit structure that they should have had on there before the explosion? Yeah, that thing. Well, he could not go inside due to the high levels of radiation, but once he was down there, he could hear screams coming from the inside due to a fire. So what did he do? He ran upstairs to the control room to get help, and once he barged open the door, he was told that he was the first person to open that door in three years. He was also told that the only way in was where he was, and if someone came in after him, they would have tripped the alarm. So it was impossible for anyone else to be down there except him. There was also a floodlight that turned on and off at very strange moments, leading the crew to believe someone or something was in the building with them. But what was it? Mm, I don't know. You be the judge. In our seventh spot today, we have the ghostly figure. There are tons of ghosts that haunt Chernobyl. I mean, any place where a huge tragedy takes place is bound to be haunted. In this case, the ghost was captured on live TV. So Sci-Fi Channel's Destination Truth went to Chernobyl and conducted a number of paranormal investigations. They even went to Reactor 4. While there, they saw a human figure appear on a thermal imaging camera. They believe that that is the soul of a worker that died from the explosion. They also checked out a number of abandoned hospitals and saw multiple figures moving throughout the hospital on the thermal imaging camera as well. Isn't that spooky? Moving on to number six, we have the elephant's foot. The elephant's foot is a large mass of black choria. It's given the name the elephant's foot because it's shaped sort of like an elephant's foot. Now, this thing is highly deadly. It emits high levels of radiation. Anyone exposed to it for minutes could die from radiation poisoning. And guess what? Although it's not as active as it was back in the day, it is still generating heat and still melting down into the base of Chernobyl. The scariest part, if it comes in contact with water, another explosion could occur. Now, eventually the elephant's foot will cool on its own, but even then it will still remain highly radioactive and no one should ever go near it. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the raccoon dog. This is a really freaking weird animal found in Chernobyl. When people first saw it, they actually thought Thought the radiation caused a dog and a raccoon to just fuse together. Basically, they are found all throughout the exclusion zone and they are thriving there. It's crazy to see how they have adapted to live in a highly radioactive area. Now, these things are freaking cute. In fact, they are the most observed animals in that area by scientists. Coming in at number four, we have the fire bugs. These are tiny but deadly radioactive bugs. They were discovered back in 2011 when two friends were out collecting flowers in the exclusion zone. Don't worry, they were doing this for scientific reasons, you know, to study the pollen, not to just create a deadly radioactive bouquet of flowers. Anyways, while doing so, they came across these fire bugs. They then went around collecting hundreds of these bugs some from areas with higher levels of radiation and some from areas with lower radiation levels. In the end, they found that those exposed to higher levels of radiation had deformities. I mean, yeah, just as you suspected. Either way, you don't want those bad boys crawling on your skin for a number of reasons. Coming in at our halfway point at number five, we have a Chernobyl cover-up. In a documentary titled The Russian Woodpecker, Fodor Alexandrovich explains a conspiracy theory that the Chernobyl blast was actually orchestrated to cover up the failure of the Russian woodpecker. Now, it wasn't a Russian bird or the Russian version of Woody the woodpecker. The Russian woodpecker was actually an array radar that was meant to detect missiles before they were launched. The device was named after its woodpecker-like sound it would make during its operation. It cost 7 billion rubles and unfortunately did not work. It is suspected that it didn't work because of the northern lights messing with its signals, but it can't be for certain. So instead of suffering this terrible embarrassment, the Chernobyl plant that was known for its instability blew up, distracting everyone from the failure of the woodpecker. It's hard to say how likely all of this is, but when shooting the woodpecker documentary, apparently some pretty weird stuff happened to the documentary crew, such as visits from secret police services as well as even one 
one crew member being shot by a hidden sniper during the Euro Maiden protests. Whatever the truth is here, it sounds like they were putting their nose where it wasn't wanted. At number four, we have no containment building. Back in 1986, when the Chernobyl explosion actually happened, there was quite mysteriously no containment building that surrounded the reactors. Usually there are containment structures around radioactive places like the reactors located in Chernobyl. They are gas tight structures that are usually made of steel reinforced concrete so it can confine fission products that could release into the atmosphere during an accident if one were to happen. Sure enough, we all know that one happened here and interestingly enough, it was not prepared for an accident that dangerous. According to author Richard Mueller of the book Physics for Future Presidents, the science behind the headlines, if there would have been a containment unit around the reactors, Mueller believes that there would have been virtually no deaths. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder if this coincides with any of the conspiracy of the Russian woodpecker as mentioned before. Maybe. In our number seven spot today, we have the liquidators. In the immediate aftermath of the disaster, Soviet authorities sent in robots to help with the cleanup efforts in the most hazardous areas. This was an amazing idea until the robots quickly became damaged or destroyed by the high levels of radiation in the environment. The robots faced several challenges, including damage to their electronic components and problems with their movement systems. The high levels of radiation also made it difficult for the robots to function as the radiation would interfere with the robot's sensors and their controls. Of course, with robots out of the picture, humans were the ones who continued with the cleanup efforts. Known as liquidators, these people were primarily Soviet military personnel, firefighters, and volunteers who were tasked with containing the radioactive material and preventing further contamination, and they faced extreme danger and were exposed to high levels of radiation. Many of these people were working without proper protective gear and in close proximity to the highly radioactive material. Despite these dangers, the liquidators worked tirelessly to contain the disaster and prevent further harm. Many of the liquidators suffered from acute radiation sickness, with symptoms including nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Long-term health effects including cancer and other illnesses have also been reported among the liquidators. The liquidators played a very vital role in preventing further harm from the Chernobyl disaster, and they are often referred to as heroes for their bravery and their sacrifice. Many have received recognition and awards for their efforts, but many continue to to suffer from the long-term health effects of their exposure to the radiation. In our number six spot today, we have the abandoned amusement park. The Pripyat amusement park, located in the town of Pripyat in Ukraine, was set to open on May 1st, 1986, just days after the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. The park was intended to be a celebration of the town's prosperity and the Soviet Union's technological achievements, but it never opened its doors to the public due to the disaster. The park features a Ferris wheel, bumper cars, a carousel, and other rides which still stand today as an eerie reminder of the town's abandoned past. The Ferris wheel is particularly haunting with rusted and decaying carts. The amusement park was never fully completed and its rides were never tested or operated, and today it serves as a chilling symbol of the devastating impact of the Chernobyl disaster on the town and its people. Despite the danger posed by the high levels of radiation in the area, the Pripyat amusement park has become a popular destination for tourists seeking to witness the haunting beauty of the abandoned rides and the town itself. In our number five spot today, we have the pilot. This is another first-hand account from right after the disaster, and this one comes from Igor Pismensky, who was a helicopter navigator following the disaster. After the meltdown, helicopter crews were sent out to try and spread decontamination materials over the site. One of these crews was actually killed trying to do this work after they crashed at the site. Of the disaster, Igor said, quote, they told us there had been an explosion at the plant, so they needed our help. The mission was, after the firemen, to drop down loads of stuff from helicopters to the destroyed reactor. First sand, then lead, dolomite, boron. We would load up about 15 kilometers distance from the reactor. They would put sandbags into parachutes. Then we would take off and pass around in a conveyor fashion. There would be a circle of up to 40 helicopters in the air, which would fly over and right above the reactor every two to three minutes. No one opened the windows. The chopper was all shut, but it was not airtight. It was not protected against radiation. The view of the destroyed reactor down below after the main fire had been put out, you could see separate glowing reddish fire beds in the first days. This was the view from the height of 200 meters. Of course, we knew this was dangerous, but what we did not have was adequate protective gear for the mission, but that's the responsibility of those who sent us there. Radiation is considered invisible. It cannot be seen, but you can feel it. That is, you can feel a certain metallic taste in your mouth and a sore throat. Radiation never passes without a trace, so the consequences are always there, and radiation
inflammation usually hits precisely those parts of the body that are the most vulnerable. So for everyone who's gone through Chernobyl, there are consequences. I remember so well the first time we flew over Pripyat town. The whole town had been evacuated by then, but everything looked sort of surreal. Linen is hanging on laundry lines, on balconies, you see dropped bicycles, abandoned cars, no life around, all people gone, but their stuff is still there. When the catastrophe happened, there was the Soviet Union. We had 15 constituent republics playing their part in handling this mess. Today, no country in the world would be in a position to handle the problem of this magnitude if it happened again. In our number three spot today, we have Kopachi. Kopachi was a village in Ukraine that was affected by the disaster. The village was situated close to the nuclear power plant and its residents were exposed to high levels of radiation. To contain the spread of contamination, the Soviet government ordered the evacuation and burial of the village, including burying the contaminated soil under a layer of clean soil. Today, Kopachi remains abandoned and designated as a part of the exclusion zone around the Chernobyl plant. The village and surrounding areas serve as a reminder of the devastating consequences of nuclear disasters and the importance of nuclear safety. In our number two spot today, we have the plant. It might come as a surprise, but the Chernobyl nuclear plant didn't just shut down entirely after the disaster. Despite the contamination and the risks associated, they continued to use the plant for years to come. Reactor 4, which exploded during the accident, was completely destroyed, and the other reactors were shut down over time. The Soviet government continued to use parts of the plant for several years to generate electricity and heat for the surrounding area, but eventually the plant was decommissioned. It wasn't until December of 2000 that the final reactor, Reactor 3, was shut down. Reactor 2 was shut down in 1991, and 1 was shut down in 1996. It is thought that the plant should be fully out of use by 2028. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the containment. After the disaster took place, the damaged reactor, reactor number four, was sealed in a heavy concrete sarcophagus that was meant to keep the radiation concealed and contained. While this may seem like a foolproof plan, there are many debates about how effective this containment actually is and how effective it may or may not continue to be. These are, of course, super important questions and considering the fact that it's something we've never really had to deal with before in any way, how are we really supposed to know until we try? The building of a new structure called the New Safe Confinement Structure started in 2006 and it was completed in 2017. The new structure is 843 feet wide, 531 feet long, and 356 feet tall and is meant to keep the reactor and its previous sarcophagus contained for at least the next 100 years. Despite that relatively short amount of time, experts say that the exclusion zone and surrounding area will remain uninhabitable for the next 20,000 years. Number 8. Silhouettes of Missing Townspeople before I go any further on this one, let me just say that these silhouettes are not actually of real people left after the blast. A couple of sneaky and daring graffiti artists said to be from Germany and Belarus snuck into the radiation zone and thought it would be a good idea to spray paint silhouettes of people who once lived in this beautiful little community. So these pieces more or less resemble what once was rather than resembling actual humans from the town. That being said, there are some unique silhouettes through the radiation zone, such as a little girl with pigtails reaching for a light switch in a random abandoned room. Somewhere outside, a boy pulling a truck towards a corner of the building, as well as silhouettes of random people dancing, and to finish it off, a small group of children jumping together in terror of the blast. Pretty morbid, if you ask me. Whether these silhouettes are based on specific real people or not, these random silhouettes are definitely a haunting thing to see, and I don't want to see them. Coming in at number 7, we have the Bloody Red. The Bloody Red, or the Red Forest, is the name given to the forest area around Chernobyl. Why is it called that? Well, this area received a lot of radiation fallout. As a result, the trees turned this bright orange color and then died. Nowadays, not a single tree can grow there anymore. In fact, this area is considered the most radioactive land area on the planet. Yes, on the planet. Obviously, as a result, the 400 hectares of land are off limits. It's strictly prohibited to go in there. I mean, duh, unless you have a death wish and want to die from exposure to radiation. What's also scary is that in 2015, a fire broke out in the forest, and even more radioactive material was released from this burning. So yeah, that forest is a big no-go zone. Also, could they have given it a creepier name, like the Bloody Red? Really? Really? Number 4. Radiation Eating Fungus In the words of Jeff Goldblum, life uh, finds a way. Currently, there is a fungus growing inside the damaged fourth reactor of Chernobyl where radiation levels are still insanely high. 
Discovered by scientists back in 2002, this fungus, when tested, showed that when exposed to higher ionizing radiation, it would actually grow faster. What happened to the tested fungus after? <laughs> Who knows? Either way, I do wish I could have been there to test it with the other scientists because I hear they were some pretty fun guys. <laughs> I'll show myself out. Coming in at number two is quite possibly the strangest but most obvious thing you will find in all of Chernobyl. Tourists! Apparently around 12,000 tourists visit the exclusion zone every single year. One tourism company promises 11 hours of excitement with a respirator and a dosimeter included. There are even some nearby hotels that request you leave your radioactive shoes outside and don't bring them into the hotel with you once you return. No matter how safe or unsafe you think it is to visit the exclusion zone, quite obviously thousands of people from around the world go and visit every single year. Honestly, it does seem kind of cool and I'm sure there's a gift shop somewhere that sells shirts that say, I went all the way to Chernobyl and all I got was this shirt and an extra thumb. I'd buy that. Hey Lizzie, you want to go to Chernobyl with me? No. Okay. <laughs> and in our number one spot today, we have the Stalkers. This is absolutely insane. I don't think you guys are ready for this one. But the Stalkers is the name given to a group of Russians and Ukrainians that romanticize the apocalyptic environment of Pripyat. They sneak into abandoned buildings and explore them. Sometimes they even sleep over there. Also, to make matters weirder, they bring a gauger counter to see how much radiation they were exposed to on their journeys. Not only that, but apparently they also like to eat the fruit that grows in the danger zone. Like this is their definition of fun and they just love it. I highly, highly, highly recommend you don't do this, you know, for a number of obvious reasons. In our number five spot today, we have the alien invasion. Okay, it seems absolutely insane, but there is an alien conspiracy that actually revolves around Chernobyl, and there are people who believe it's true. There is part of this theory that I like, and that is because it basically suggests that aliens saved humanity. Yeah, in this story, they didn't cause disaster or try to steal our planet, and instead, they saved us from a complete and total meltdown. What happened, and how this all started, is that around the same time of the Chernobyl disaster, people reported spotting a number of UFOs. One witness even said that they saw a UFO for six hours. So basically, because of this uptick in sightings, people believe that the aliens came to help sort of diffuse some of the radiation levels that were seen after the disaster. This would have helped to prevent an even larger blast with an even higher amount of death and illness. This is sort of a conspiracy brought up to explain how, while this meltdown was of course catastrophic, it didn't leave like apocalyptic level damage, which believers of this theory said there should have been. So what do we think? Did aliens come to save the planet? In our number four spot today, we have The Musician. This is a story that comes from a Redditor named Jake, but this actually isn't Jake's story. This is the story of a man named Yuri who Jake met at a bar in Finland. Yuri is actually a Chernobyl survivor and he had quite the harrowing tale to share with Jake. Yuri is a musician and at the time of the disaster, he was in a state sponsored musical dance troupe. Basically, as soon as the disaster happened, this group was called upon by the government to come in and calm the people living in the area. Yuri said, quote, mere hours after the meltdown commenced, our bus entered the exclusion zone at checkpoint Ditjatki. We were told not anything and the soldiers made it forbidden for speaking with the village people. Imagine not knowing a disaster taking place, yet seeing the strange workings of the radioactivity all around. Everyone was sick and dying, yet quarantined and not allowed to leave the zone. This is all chilling, but this is where the story takes a terrifying turn. He begins to describe their final performance, which was in Pripyat. The ballerina danced, knowing something horrible had happened, and she danced like never before. And she even let her hair down from her bun to just let it flow. Suddenly though, Yuri noticed that these locks of hair weren't just falling out of her bun, they were falling down to the ground. Basically, Yuri ends off his story by explaining his escape, which was through back roads and avoiding military checkpoints, and he ends off by saying that he is the only one of his group to survive. Number eight, the Soviet Union sacrificed soldiers. So rumor has it that the Russians sent in robots to try and clean up the explosion site, put out fires, and contain the reactor. But the radiation was so harsh that all the robots broke down. So they went to the next best thing. Soldiers. It said that soldiers were given an ultimatum to date me or I don't want to see you anymore. Wait, I'm thinking about the wrong unstable reactor. No, what the Russian government actually said was spend two minutes shoveling sand onto the exposed reactor or 
go fight in Afghanistan for two years. Really the worst choice ever. Go fight in an intense war where a bunch of people are dying every day and your chances of coming back in one piece are slim to none or for sure get radiation poisoning. Something interesting about the Russian soldiers who decided to shovel sand onto the exposed reactor, they were called liquidators because they would take shots of vodka before they went in. Vodka was thought to prevent any conditions related to radiation. We really knew nothing back in the day. Number 7. The land is safe to live on. Radiation is very bad, we all know this. Comic books have lied to us. Radiation does not give you any sort of superpowers. If you want superpowers, you need to be an alien or super rich. Those are the only ways. After the Chernobyl disaster, the radiation of the surrounding area was at unlivable levels, or that's at least what the government said. Some people from local villages didn't care, and after everything was said and done, they fought to go back to their homes. They wanted the right to live where they used to live, and they were granted freedom to do so. There are over 100 people living in the exclusion zone, and their life expectancy isn't any shorter than that of the average person. They grow crops, hunt animals, and even drink the water. Water, all of which has recorded high levels of radiation. But no one seems to care or be affected by it. Maybe if someone has a baby born out of there, we'll get our first superhero. Just a little bit of radiation right out of the womb. Maybe that's the trick. Number six, this could have changed the world. Even though there was an explosion at the Chernobyl plant, it wasn't a massive meltdown. It ruined the surrounding area and the reactor site is still extremely dangerous, but it could have been much worse. If there was a total meltdown, down, like a Britney Spears 2007 shaving her head level meltdown, running around with Kevin Federline level meltdown, the world would have been a much different place. The nuclear fallout would have made Europe unlivable and millions of people would have died. The Spice Girls would have never existed. It would have been a major bummer on epic proportions. And we can't really know how the whole world would have been affected by this. Maybe it would have only been Europe, but maybe it would have been the whole world getting hit by this nuclear fallout. Maybe all of us would have had to been raised in bunkers just like the fallout games and only resurfaced to find super mutants and three headed dogs running around and Thriller is still the number one song on the charts. That actually sounds kind of cool. Next up we have another reddit post I'm going to call laughter in the night. It was written by a now deleted user. Hey fellow urban explorers, I've been meaning to share this experience from my recent trip to Chernobyl. So me and a couple friends decided to venture into the heart of the exclusion zone. We had explored Pripyat during the day, but thought a night trek would be a little more thrilling. We found ourselves near the infamous Ferris wheel. This is creepy enough as it is at night, but my god, I will never forget this one moment for as long as I live. Me and my friends are just bumming around the Ferris wheel. I wasn't paying much attention to what they were talking about, kind of zoning out. I suddenly heard a faint, distant laughter, like children were playing just off in the distance. And it wasn't just me that heard it, everyone went quiet immediately. One of my buddies had the bright idea of following the laughter. I was pretty reluctant, but ultimately we all agreed to have a look. We followed the sound and as we got closer, it dawned on us and I sh you not, we ended up at a school. The laughter had been coming from inside. Then as abruptly as it began, the laughter stopped. We noped out of there screaming. To this day, we can't explain what we heard. Would you have gone and followed the laughter? I don't know. I, I feel like I, I, I'd like to, like that sounds interesting. But uh, I, I don't know, in the moment, I might have just left. I don't know. What do you guys think though? Let us, let us know in the comments.